wonderful. Welcome, everybody. This is AgMIP 8, virtual web shop on food systems, shocks, and actions. Um, this, the, we have a full week of, um, of events. Um, uh, uh, the 13th to the 15th, this is now day two of the core of the web, the web shop. But Monday we had workshops, team meetings. Friday we're going to have uh, an, a, another workshop uh, as well. Uh, but today is Resilience Day. Resilience to food shocks and stresses. So from now to 11.30, this is what we're going to be focused on. To share with you the AgMIP 8 program at a glance, and just to remind you that registrants can attend all sessions. For more details and the Zoom links, go to www.agmip.org. Um, we got we had a fantastic day yesterday, really introducing shocks, food systems, shocks, and food security, and then had with keynote speakers and then um, had a uh, great session in the afternoon in which the AgMIP uh, team leaders, many of them, but uh, but there's even more that are going to um, be sending information that we're going to be posting on advances in modeling. Um, so today, turning to resilience to foods, what resilience to the shocks, we can't just leave it as, at mo as modeling the shocks itself. Um, so just to very briefly say what we're going to be doing today, and then I'll, t I'll turn it over to the session chair. Um, uh, we are going to uh, be having a, a wonderful keynote by uh, Mark Howden, and then we're going straight to breakouts, um, uh, shocks and resilient breakouts, asking questions such as how can they be currently modeled? What are novel approaches for improving modeling? What data, of course, always with models, data and models, models and data go together. There are three um, topics, there are three areas for the breakout groups. The first one is farming systems, led by John Antle, Roberto Valdivia, and Heidi Weber. The second one is on value chains, markets, and trade. These are, you can see, the components of the food system emerging. This is led by Sabine Homan Kitui and David Laborde. Uh, and the third one is on diets, food security, and nutrition, led by Pauline Schielbeck and Marco Springman. Then we'll get all back together again to hear uh, report backs and have further discussion um, about resilience. Um, you'll be reminded by, um, by me and others, please put your comments in at comments, questions into Q&A throughout the whole session. Although in the breakouts, it'll be a little bit different. You'll be able to chat there and with your breakout groups. Um, but um, and the, in the plenaries, please feel free to, and we encourage questions and, and, we, and we will try to respond. So with that, I want to introduce the chair of the session, Herman Lutzekampen. He in, at uh, the Potsdam Institute for Klimat um, in, um, in Germany. He, he is um, uh, chair of the research domain on climate impacts and vulnerabilities. He's also professor of sustainable land use and climate change at, I think it's Humboldt, right? Humboldt University in Berlin. And very important for, for AgMIV 8, he is, uh, he is uh, the, the co-leader of the AgMIV Global Economics Team. So with that, I'm uh, over to you, Hermann, looking forward to the session and welcome everyone. Yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, Cynthia. Can you understand? Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks uh, everyone for joining. Um, actually, Cynthia, uh, the, the name of the, my department at PIC has actually changed to climate resilience earlier, the, earlier this year. So that fits nicely to this um, day and this session in AgMIP. Um, so, as Cynthia said, we are moving from the food shocks um, and current status of modeling to the enhanced understanding of resilience to food shocks and, and stresses. Um, and of course, we want to make advantage of, of all the knowledge in AgMIP uh, across the different domains from, from crop modeling to, um, to livestock modeling to economics at different uh, spatial scales. 
So I think we've seen again yesterday that there's this wealth of, of methods and, and knowledge and expertise, um, which we all need, I think, to improve our understanding of, of resilience, um, because, well, understanding resilience, of course, links uh, climate impacts with, um, with options for, for adaptation, um, but also to some extent there is links to like synergies between adaptation and, and mitigation also to show um, new options and, and um, synergies for all these challenges to be tackled. So um, we have tried in the past to, to link across those um, disciplinary domains, but also across scales. Yesterday we learned again that there's still a lot to be done especially the cross-scale interactions uh, in the economics domain, for example, it's not so easy to get from the farm scale to the regional to country scale to the global scale. I think there are promising examples, but I think this, these sessions today can help to, to advance our understanding and also to generate new ideas um, how we can uh, improve our, our understanding. So I think these three sessions on or breakout sessions on farm systems, on value chains, markets and trades, and on diets, food security, and nutrition are very well positioned um, to, to discuss specific issues there. And then hopefully in the, in the, when we come back to plenary after those breakouts, we'll kind of summarize um, on that. So I think that should be relatively clear. It's now my uh, big pleasure to introduce um, Mark uh, Howden. Um, so Mark is a director of the Climate Change Institute at the Australian National University. He's also an honorary professor at Melbourne University, um, a vice chair of the uh, IPCC and a member of the Australian National Climate Change Advisory Committee. Um, he, he was on the US Federal Advisory Committee for the third national climate assessment and uh, contributes to several major national and international science and policy advisory bodies. Um, Mark, the floor is now yours and we hope to get your, um, or participate in your deep knowledge on climate or resilience to, uh, in, on, on food systems and uh, please uh, share your presentation with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Herman, and uh, thank you very much, Cynthia and Eric, for uh, inviting me here and, uh, and organising this uh, presentation. So um, just before I, I start, I, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on who I stand. Uh, that's the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So I'll just um, share my screen here and hopefully that will work. And... Uh, and so that's okay. Whoops. Come on, that's right. Um, yes, very well. And let What's me just mean? make one remark. I forgot to say, if people uh, on this uh, meeting here have questions, please put them into the, the Q&A session and we'll try to respond, but people can also interact there on those questions. Okay. Thank you. Mark, please. Um, thanks, Herman. So, so what I'm just talking today is, is a very much an overview of uh, issues to do with resilience and essentially how understanding this may give us a bit of a smooth ride into a bit of a challenging future. So resilience is a word that's raised in many conversations these days. Um, it's, it's used by farmers, agribusiness people, policymakers and politicians. And uh, and so, so it's widely used, but not necessarily widely understood. Um, and when we actually disentangle um, the word and how it's used, um, it's actually highly ambiguous and it's used for different purposes in different contexts. And sometimes it's used to describe exact opposite things to each other. So as I write down here, um, resilience or, or that general concept is used variously to justify either preparation or recovery, change or stasis, bottom up or top down processes, attributes of a system or the system outcomes and proactive activities or reactive activities. And the list could go on. And you can see that when we start to think about that, it's, it's really interesting because you've got a word which actually describes many opposite things. And so 
um, it's challenging in terms of how we then conceptualize that in a way that we can do quantitative analysis. And there's another dimension of resilience which is starting to appear in the literature. And that is the, there's a discourse emerging about how resilience is now starting to be weaponized by governments in particular. And the way this happens is it's essentially used as a way of avoiding responsibility and engagement with disadvantaged peoples because uh, the discourse goes that um, if we can establish that those peoples or communities or other groups uh, describe themselves as resilient, then it actually, the government or the aid agencies can then move on um, and leave them to it um, because they've actually self-described and self analysed as being resilient. And, and lastly, uh, resilience is renowned to be very difficult to measure as a concept and to actually take it into a domain uh, which you can have effective monitoring and evaluation. Now, when we actually start to disentangle that a little bit further is that, um, and look at how the word is used by different groups. So the common use, like the dictionary definition of resilience, is it's either a recovery from an event or it's returning to a prior state of affairs after an event or sometimes both. And the really important difference between those two is that recovery allows for change and adaptation, whereas returning to the prior state of affairs doesn't. So there's a difference in nuance between those two different ways it's used. In the literature, which perhaps this uh, group of people um, in attendance tonight may be more familiar with, that's the social ecological research literature, is that resilience is often framed in a sense that it's the ability to absorb change, adverse events and other things like that, um, and still maintain the same relationships or functioning as it previously did. And that comes about through a series of characteristics which are related to persistence and adaptiveness, management of variability, cross-scale interactions, and management of unpredictability. And, and in that sense, um, we've seen a, a, a burgeoning of um, you know, the, the broad usage of that word. So that's where I think the broadening out of the usage has come from. But really important to note that different disciplines use this very differently. So if you go into the psychological literature, it's used differently. If you go into the engineering literature, it's used differently. So it's much more that elasticity idea bouncing back to where it was before. So that does leave us with a challenge here, which is, um, and, and some uh, authors in, in different papers have actually said that we actually need to define the word at the point of use in some way. And, and that of course is a challenge because the whole point of language is we actually have predefined pre meanings for words rather than having to define them at the point of use. But nevertheless, is that you know, it's very clear that um, there's a lot of interest in um, having uh, resilience as a underlying concept or an overarching concept. And, and so what I thought I'd do for this talk is, is actually break it down into some different components. Um, and, and for this particular talk, I'm using a, a, a framework um, which is put together by Quentin Grafton and, and colleagues. And this particular framework, and it's one of many, you can there's dozens and dozens of, of resilience frameworks, um, this one looks at uh, components of resistance, uh, recovery and recovery time, and robustness. So resistance is the ability to change actively so as to maintain system performance following or maybe due um, adverse events. So in a sense, it's inherent adaptive, adaptiveness um, in, in relatively short time scales. There's an element of resist, uh, resilience, which is about recovery and recovery time. So it's about recovery to a desired function or state of performance. And then there's an element of robustness, which is about the probability of maintaining critical functionality given adverse or changing circumstances. Now, one of the things that often occurs when people start to break things down like this in a somewhat reductionist way, is we lose sight of the broader systems and that system adaptation, I think, is really important. Um, so that's where a lot of the um, broader complexity of biophysical systems and socioeconomic systems comes into play here. 
And, and I think that's really important because that's where we can start to make sensible strategic changes to the system itself, rather than just looking at the components of a response to the system. And in, importantly, bringing in some of those cross-scale elements that um, Herman just mentioned before. And when I talk about adaptation, it's very much the standard sort of definition. It's adjustments in response to actual perceived or expected changes in the environment in which we operate. Now, we, we have an expectation that if we actually do this well, there's been going to be a whole series of benefits from doing this in agriculture and food and related systems. So, so clearly part of that is about lowering the risk of failure, particularly gross failure, things like failures of production systems or supply chains, um, reduction in impacts or adverse impacts from negative um, events, more rapid and complete recovery, being more stable in the face of change, particularly unpredictable change, an ability to develop adaptive capacity and transfer that across systems in sensible ways. And, and clearly, um, I guess we're all actually here in, in this sort of uh, profession because our assessment is that um, it's a riskier world that we're going into and we'll actually need all of these tools and a lot more to manage that risk. So I'll just produce a few simple sort of diagrams to sort of illustrate that risk without going into great depth. Um, these are the adverse events. So clearly um, climate change, global warming is going to bring heat stress. Um, this is work from Maura et al from a couple of years ago. Top left hand panel is historical heat stress frequency. Um, this is what they call deadly heat stress days in this um, uh, paper. The bottom right hand panel is uh, heat stress days under a high emission scenario at the, towards the end of the century. And under large areas of the world, particularly developing countries, uh, we see almost every day becoming a heat stress day. And, and that's going to impact on humans, um, animals and on uh, crops and uh, you know, other biological systems. And so, so that's a huge um, element of risk, which has both um, chronic elements as well as uh, extreme um, critical acute elements. If we look at things like disruption associated with El Nino systems, uh, this is work from Scott Power, um, looking at those disruptions, essentially that's the variance associated with ENSO, both the El Nino and the La Nina phases, uh, looking increase in frequency from pre-industrial times up to the present, and then looking into the future with high emissions scenario or a lower emission scenario. And you can see this assessment is we've already undergone significant increase in frequency of these disruptions, and that will increase radically if we go into a high emission scenario from here on in. And so clearly that's a circumstance where we need to have um, responsive systems where there's good risk management. And the last of these that I'll show is uh, cyclones. So cyclones impact on uh, countries uh, you know, right around the globe. Um, and when we look at global numbers of cyclones, uh, they're increasing, uh, but most worryingly, it's the uh, frequency of the really, really nasty cyclones, the category three, four, and five ones that are increasing most. And that panel on the right-hand side shows that there's been more than a 300% increase in those cyclones which have very, very high wind speeds. And of course, wind speeds, um, the damage function is essentially the cube of wind speed. So small increases in wind speed significantly increase the damage associated with that. But it's not only that these, there's more of them and they're getting stronger on average, um, but uh, we're also seeing them in new places. So polewood migration in the Northern Hemisphere moving towards the North Pole and the Southern Hemisphere towards the South Pole. So that's expanding the area affected by tropical cyclones. So really significant um, disruptor to coastal type um, farming systems. And of course, it's not just climate change impacts and the adaptation responses needed to that. It's also managing greenhouse gas emission reductions. So agriculture and food systems produce almost a third. So the central um, tendency was 29% coming out of the special report on land, land use change and climate. Um, there's potential for increased trade disruptions with and without climate change um, associated with biosecurity and human health pandemics. Um, increased price volatility, which we've seen in the past, um, particularly about 10 years ago. Uh, things like export restrictions, which are starting to come in as we get more nationalism coming into the um, domestic politics of various countries. 
an increasingly connected value chain. So a disruption in one place can propagate out into many different other places. We've also seen potential for digital agriculture, um, significantly disrupting existing business models, things like genetic developments, um, potential radical changes in the materials that we have there, and things like consumer preference and technology, which is driving plant-based food um, expansion. So things like the Impossible Burger, Perfect Day Burger, and even just um, people moving into vegetarianism or veganism uh, is increasing very significantly. And there's good basis for health reasons as well as environmental reasons for people to take on that in, in, and as well as ethical reasons as well. And so I don't think these trends are going to go away, but they're all disruptors and this list could go on and on. So what I thought I'd do here is just produce a few little, uh, very simple um, graphics which try to illustrate those different components of uh, resilience in systems. So that's the resistance, recovery, uh, amount, recovery time and robustness, as well as the system change. And, uh, and sort of then try to link it into some of the things that your community of practice uh, deals with particularly. And there's aspects of quantitative analysis that could be undertaken on these. So if you're thinking about a system which starts out um, uh, you know, in, in some sort of equilibrium, I'm, I'm not an equilibrium person, but you know, just for simplicity, um, we have an on the ad, you know, the adverse event starts to have an onset here. And in an unadapted system, we find a very steep decline in function. If you can think of this maybe as a cyclone um, knocking down a banana plantation. Um, and then a, a long steady recovery back up to something similar to the function it had before. Uh, the black line in all of these examples is the unadapted system. The dashed line is the adapted system or the one that we've put in place um, different resilience mechanisms. And so if we're starting to think about um, this as resistance, resistance is essentially how can a system uh, adapt either immediately inside that event or immediately after that event uh, to reduce the impact of that event. And so that's why the dashed line doesn't go down as far. The, the trough of the unadapted system is deeper than the one of the adapted system. So there's resistance built into that system. And this could happen through genetics. So for example, heat and drought tolerant um, uh, um, species uh, are able to handle um, a, say a heat event or a drought event without the same degree of reduction in productivity. In a diverse uh, agroecosystem, uh, it's possible to switch um, uh, focus in that system and maintain some degree of um, economic output uh, through that diversity. So you can actually move emphasis in different things or perhaps in an irrigation system, it's shifting that water around to the highest value use. Um, there's potential for in-crop responses, say for supplementary watering so that you don't hit the bottom of that trough. Or in terms of um, supply chains, uh, you could have rapid supply chain reconfiguration. So this is effectively inside um, the event um, and or immediately afterwards. And, and so you don't get the same disruptions that you would if you didn't have that ability to reconfigure um, rapidly, which often is about um, uh, developing the relationships and the trust before the event rather than afterwards. And there's also things like trade, um, which can be used to um, reduce, say, food security impacts of, of events such as drought or increase soft sufficiency. So that has been uh, de demonstrated to reduce, say, the impacts of price volatility of commodities. And so um, there's a whole range of things that we can do to adapt the system um, and so that it actually has less impact, or an adverse um, event has less impact. If we go to um, say the recovery element, so again, using that same sort of idea, um, we have an adverse impact, um, it, it has an immediate um, reduction in function and a gradual increase, but not to the degree that it had before. So we don't have a full recovery. Whereas in a, a, an adapted system or a res resilient system, we get close to a full recovery. So elements or examples of this may be effective replanting post event or restocking of animals. So bringing in animals to increase the productivity, um, avoiding irreversible degradation. So you don't have that long-term reduction in production, uh, developing new markets so that you can expand uh, your uh, activities or expand the um, produce and possibly increasing your um, 
um, uh, economic returns from what you're doing. Um, financial mechanisms for recovery, so thinking about uh, the human aspect and, and ensuring that people can actually have enough um, uh, materials, uh, enough finance, etc., to go back to full production. If we're thinking about recovery time, that's the speed of recovery. So instead of a long, slow recovery, we have a very short, sharp um, increase and back to essentially full function. So examples of that might be in-season replanting. So if your crop gets knocked down early in the season by a negative event, um, opportunities to replant immediately and still get some yield in that season. It might be adjustment. So taking some of your animals, moving them to a place where there's uh, more feed um, and being able to bring them back onto your farm um, rapidly so you um, fully uh, you know, recover productivity uh, very quickly. Um, rapid supply reconfiguration during an event, so not afterwards, but actually whilst it's happening. And so that you actually have very, very rapid responses, um, bringing back food into um, places where there's disruption, etc. And things like changing market demand, so, so potentially um, scarcity, uh, raising prices and offsetting at least part of the damage. And lastly, it's um, that robustness and system adaptation element. So, so in this particular example, we've got multiple um, adverse events uh, which happen sequentially. Uh, in some of those systems, uh, we get um, progressive degradation of the system. Um, in others, in the adapted system, we get bounce back um, to something like full function um, on a sequential basis. So if we look at the robustness element, um, one example of that would be in developing adaptive capacity and preventative um, capacity including things like seasonal climate forecasts. So we reduce the probability of having a negative event in the first place. So it's that prevention element. Um, if we're thinking about the system, um, it may actually be changing the system itself. So moving from say a crop to a mixed grazing system uh, or moving from a dryland system to a supplementary irrigation system to offset some of the negatives. And, and there's elements of that system change which are not just farm scale but can become cross scale and so um, that includes uh, things like uh, uh, relocation of industries and aggregation of industries and things like that. If we're looking at value chains it may be maintenance of critical nodes in value chains so for example in an adverse event like a, a very long drought something critical like a, a food processing uh, factory or a cannery may actually go out of business and because of the economics, uh, you can't actually restart it or you can't reconfigure it um, afterwards. And so you lose that capacity essentially on a permanent basis. And so I'm um, thinking about those critical nodes um, as maintenance of your um, broader system. In, in a human sense, uh, maybe action to avoid poverty traps. So uh, people who get driven down and down and down um, because of adverse events where they haven't got the capacity to bounce back and maintain function. And lastly, because of that um, elements of uh, sort of ambiguity and uncertainty about the very nature of what we're dealing with, I think it's, it's important to develop strategic capacity um, across our systems so that we can actually make good long-term decisions. We can actually detect these long-term trends and respond effectively, which means we have to have active monitoring and evaluation so that if we're getting things like degradation or not nutrient or carbon rundown, which then impact on food security, um, crop quality, etc., uh, that we can detect them and take action at an appropriate time. So a real quick summary is what I've tried to do is, is give a sort of a, a starting point from uh, the nature of the use, the definitions of resilience, um, broken it down into some, com some components, tried to translate those components into things that you deal with in terms of your analytical capabilities, and then start to think about how we can take that into action so that we can actually have much more adapted and resilient agricultural systems. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, also, um, right on time, actually. I think we have time for maybe one or two um, questions on this. Um, I think you did a very good job also um, 
pois, uh, pointing out that resilience can be positively and negatively connotated. And I think every one of us will also have examples in their mind where, you know, resilience to something is an undesirable thing. So I think that's very um, interesting. And also this definition at the point of use, I'll, I'll leave that to the breakout groups to, to think about it, whether that's necessary in these different um, contexts. So that was also very, very useful. Let me pick um, uh, one question from uh, the chat here. Um, the question is, can you say a bit about relationships between resilience and vulnerability since the two concepts are used to uh, sometimes talk about the same topic in an opposite way? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really interesting, interesting question. And, and I don't think the literature has actually settled on this. <laughs> so, so we, you know, even after some years, we, we retain differences in views. Um, uh, the, the way in which, uh, say, for example, IPCC uses vulnerability, it's a characteristic of the system uh, largely before an adverse event. Um, and so, so we can have accumulated vulnerabilities uh, which, which uh, then get expressed um, when, when um, you know, an event occurs. And, and so that's different from uh, um, sort of use of the resilience in the sense of looking at an outcome-oriented resilience terminology, um, but it's quite consistent with the terminology of resilience if you're thinking of it as the in inherent characteristics of a system. So, so depending on how you use resilience, there's a, a, a stronger alignment or a lesser alignment of the two sort of concepts there. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Um, Cynthia, if you agree, I, I think we leave it here so that we have enough time for the, for the breakouts. Um, I think this was a great introduction a nice charge to the breakout groups actually, because uh, now people can think about whether this concept or this, these elements of resistance, recovery and robustness make sense to them or whether they have other suggestions. And I hope we can bring some of these thoughts uh, back into the, into the plenary. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, this was a great introduction. Cynthia, over to you. Yes, and yes, everyone. Just, I just wanted to add my thanks to Mark. Thank you so much because I know it's very late or middle of the night and that you were able to present in person such a wonderful, wonderful, uh, thoughtful, critical analysis as always, um, guiding, helping, really playing a, a major role in guiding our field. So thank you to that. Thank you, Mark, for everything and for this and all, all, your, all your leadership in our field. So thank you very much. I'm, absolutely I'm, clapping. Yeah. I'm clapping for everybody. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Great. So, Herman, over to you to uh, uh, let's start the breakout groups. Um, can you give the charge? And um, then uh, uh, Eric is also standing by to give the technical details of how people get to their breakout groups. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, you pointed out in the beginning, I hope that everyone has their, the program in front of them. Um, so uh, there were these three questions as, as charges. So which shocks and interventions can currently be modeled uh, in your food system component? What are novel approaches to improve modeling for resilience decisions? And what data are most critical for um, advancement? So I think that's a clear charges. I'm looking forward to coming back to this um, virtual room in about 90 minutes. And I understand uh, everyone has to log off from this link and go to the uh, Zoom link for the breakout session they have uh, chosen to attend. I hope that's uh, all for now. Or Eric, please add if there's anything missing. Yes, yes, that's correct. So you all have, <clears throat> you know, you all should have your program with the links, but I did just put them in the um, in the in the chat. So you know, you you can choose what whichever of the three um, breakouts that you're interested in. And then, yeah. So as Herman said, so this is going to go nine thirty to eleven, or you know, it depends on your on your time zone. But yeah, the next ninety minutes. Um, and then yes, at I'll say eleven a.m. in New York time. Um, so we do ask. You know the, the the people who are leading uh, the breakouts are also will have uh, at least one Colombia person in each group also to try to uh, get people. But yeah, so at, at eleven, uh, so in ninety minutes, you you click back the same link that you used to join. You know, just the session that we're on. You you click back to get back into this plenary, 
uh, for the for the report back. Okay, thank you. See you back here in 90 minutes and uh, success with the breakout groups. Thank you. Yes. See you later. I'm sorry, how you was asking, but yeah, just the same link for the for the presenters and facilitators. Just everybody uses the same link. All right, thanks everybody. Again, if you haven't seen, uh, now is the time to log off of this link and find the link in your program to join the other breakout sessions. Um, in the chat, you'll see Eric has posted some links, but please be careful, that, at least in my chat, they've kind of run into each other, so you'll have to select the, the beginning with HTTPS and find that endpoint right before where it says meeting ID. Uh, so please try to select that, and then you can find your way to those breakouts. <laughs>